Thank you. <laughs> now, you know Hugh Hewitt from Salem, but in addition to that, uh, he went to Harvard, got a uh, BA in government, he went to Michigan Law, he wrote for President Nixon, both in California and New York. He worked in the Reagan White House. Um, I know that he was a good friend of President Nixon. I heard President Nixon talk about him often, and he recruited him to come here in 1989 and build this place. So he's really my predecessor. He hired me, brought me here, uh, asked me to help on the grand opening and to create the marketing plan and I never left. He did. He went on to do many books. He's uh, a very popular speaker. He's a practicing attorney. And what I always get a kick out of, you ask him about any movie, he's seen it. You ask him about any best-selling book, he's read it. And he can analyze both the movie and the, and the book. Um, I don't know how he has any free time at all, but he generously comes here as he, as he did today and tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, introducing the KRLA Obama Care Tour. What will the court do? Is my good friend Hugh Hewitt. Gentlemen, it is uh, always good to be back at the uh, at the Richard Nixon Library and Birthplace. It's very special. I was explaining to my intern, Mark, tonight as we're coming up, how it ended up here and how appropriate it is. I hope you come back on Saturday, the hundredth birthday. I hope you see that little house and recognize that from there uh, uh, to where he is buried is only a few feet. But what a life President Nixon lived an extraordinary life and it's all commemorated here and I have a couple of friends here tonight who are extraordinary constitutional experts I think uh, on my left and my right tonight you will have uh, more constitutional expertise than you will have in any other two people that we could actually bring together short of those who are robed in on the court and for uh, 12 years uh, they have once a week on the Hugh Hewitt show come together to debate uh, what the Constitution means, what the Supreme Court is deciding, and they've done so in a great public project. They've both been law school deans, so they know what it means to communicate the essence of the law to smart people who are attempting very much to learn what it means to be a lawyer and to do the right thing as they understand it. They've been teaching constitutional law for uh, each of them. You know, years and decades. They both had uh, extraordinary experiences at the Supreme Court. They're both uh, authors of case books which are widely used. John's a little bit upset because I have used Irwin's book uh, for a dozen years and not John's. Uh, and, and that's because I now know Irwin's book and, and uh, it's shorter than John's. And I, uh, no, I, <laughs> I point out though to everyone that I am uh, so pleased in my program's dozen years duration that we have proven, as this audience proves, that there is an audience, not just for high-level conversation, but serious debate about the most important things. The country is indeed divided on some interesting and important issues, but it's not so divided that they can't talk to each other. And modeling that kind of engagement, often intense, very rarely muted, but always interesting and entertaining, are my guests tonight, and you know them. Erwin Chemerinsky is Dean of the University of California Irvine Law School, which graduated its first class uh, this past week. An extraordinary experiment in the revitalization of American legal education along a different line. John Eastman is the Dean Emeritus at Chapman University Law School, which he left when he decided to run for Attorney General of the State of California, something I which hope he does again in the future. He's now back teaching. He's also the leader of the center, uh, the Claremont Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence, about which you will hear a little bit more. Between both of them, they have argued before the nine, something I have never done, the United States Supreme Court. They know what it's like, and they know these cases. So please join me in welcoming the smart guys, Erwin Chemerinsky and John E. Smith.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you see me doing is turning off my cell phone. And so I would encourage you all to do that because uh, we're going to record this and make it available on the universe. Um, I want to get right to it. I always hate presidential debates when they spend too much time on the preliminaries. Let's dive in. I'm going to start with Dean Chemerinsky. First of all, to both of you, thank you. Dean Chemerinsky, will the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, be upheld by the Supreme Court? And should it be? Yes, six to three. Now, having said that, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for coming and to thank you for inviting John and me here. We have been on the program now for 12 years, and it's such a tremendous pleasure to be on his program and to be with you here tonight. I think the Supreme Court is going to uphold the individual mandate. As I said, I think it's going to be six to three. I think John Roberts will write the opinion for the court. I think we'll be joined by Anthony Kennedy, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. And I think the Supreme Court is going to do so by something that was said at oral argument by Justice Sotomayor. She said at one moment, and it was actually on the Tuesday of oral argument, at the hour and five minute mark, she said to the attorney for the state, Paul Clement, couldn't the federal government raise everyone's taxes to pay for health care and then give an exemption to the tax increase for those who already have health insurance? Paul Clement did a brilliant job arguing against the Affordable Care Act, but he didn't have an answer to that question. And Justice Kennedy followed up by saying, well, if Congress can do that, I don't see why this is any different. I know that President Obama never called this a tax, but functionally that's really what it is. It's either a flat rate or a small percentage of income collected by the Internal Revenue Service. And I think the Supreme Court is going to say on that basis that it's constitutional. John Eastman. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure that you all knew that Irwin and I don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Um, but I am pleased that Irwin has come around because uh, I distinctly remember back in 2010 uh, on a documentary we did for Reason TV that he predicted that it wouldn't even go to the Supreme Court, that there would be no court in the country that would strike it down. It was so clearly constitutional. Uh, and then when the District of Florida struck it down, we had a prediction that will that'll be reversed by the Court of Appeals and it still won't go to the Supreme Court. Uh, and then, of course, when the Eleventh Circuit struck it down, uh, well, it'll go to the Supreme Court, but there's only one vote there, Justice Thomas, my former boss. Uh, you can't have listened to the oral argument to think that that one's true. Uh, we've got Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, and Justice Scalia all clearly, pretty clearly, going to vote to strike this down. Uh, and I agree, though, with Irwin that the, the fight is going to be over Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy. But I have a different take on that argument. Justice Kennedy came out of the box with the first question, are you telling us that I can force people into commerce in order to create an effect on commerce that then gives me the ground to regulate it? That's not a good question from the Solicitor General's perspective on this case. And throughout the day, Justice Kennedy had similar questions like that. Uh, Justice Scalia asked, if I can force you into an individual mandate, can I force you to buy cell phones? Because it would help with our emergency care system if everybody had a cell phone can dial 911 rather than having to have boxes on the side of the road. Justice Alito asked, if I can force you to buy an individual mandate because everybody's going to need health care at some point, can I force you to buy burial insurance because everybody's going to need to die at some point? And just so the Solicitor General tried to distinguish those hypotheticals away and say, well, those are different. Justice Breyer weighed in to try and help him. I think what you meant to answer was that, yes, the government could force you to buy those things as well. You got to feel a little bit for the Solicitor General. <laughs> with, with, with friends like that, um, you, you, you know, thank you, Justice Breyer, but please, that's not helping the position I'm in here. Justice Sotomayor weighed in as well and says, I think what you mean to say is, yes, the federal government can do anything it wants under the Commerce Clause if it affects economic activity. And see, the critical question for Justice Kennedy was that day and always has been, if we accept your rationale for this legislation, is there anything the government cannot do? Because if you can't answer that for me, then what you're asking me to do is destroy the notion that ours is a government of limited enumerated powers, and that I'm not willing to do. Two or three times in the last decade and a half, Justice Kennedy has asked that question, received no satisfactory answer, and voted to strike down the law. 
And he received no satisfactory answer to that question here either. I think, though, the, 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 the crux of it comes at the very end of the day, not the question Irwin talked about, but the question that Justice Kennedy asked of Mike Carvin, one of the other two lawyers arguing uh, against the Affordable Care Act. The issue by the end of the day on Tuesday had come down to the question, is there something unique about the health care market that would allow me to uphold this without destroying the notion of limited government elsewhere? Is this market really unique? And Justice Kennedy starts the question and says, the government's arguing that it's unique. And next year they're going to be in here arguing that something else is unique. Now that sounds like he's not buying the argument very much. But then he goes on in a very telling part of the question. Justice Kennedy sometimes has a bit of a poker tell uh, in his questions. He asks Socratic method law professor questions just to press the logic of an argument almost for fun's sake. But every once in a while, a phrase I believe or I think will come out in his question. And there's a real deep insight into what he's thinking. So after he has those comments about unique, he says, but I think that it is true in all things in life are matters of degree. And it may well be that in the healthcare market, the young 30-year-old who is uninsured may be uniquely proximately close to being able to shift costs off to others that may make this market unique. Now, if, if he's now trying to find an answer to that question that the Solicitor General wouldn't give him on their own, and if he persuades himself that his answer has merit, I agree with Irwin, he votes to uphold it. And it's quite possible the Chief Justice goes along with him and it'd be six to three. But Justice Kennedy was asking that question, trying to get some help with it. And he didn't get it from the Solicitor General, who didn't want to say that there's anything the government cannot do. They didn't want to come up and say, yes, they can't do A, B, and C, because next week they might want to do A, B, and C. Um, so Justice Kennedy was trying to answer that question on his own. And if he persuades himself that it's the right answer, that it has substance, then he votes to uphold. But, but I think he was on the cusp. And quite frankly, the following Monday, when the president launched an attack against the very authority of the court to assess the constitutionality of this bill, Justice Kennedy, waffling on the cusp, as that question indicates he was, I think may have been pushed back on the side of saying it's unconstitutional. And if that happens, I think it's 5-4 to strike it down. Dean Chemerinsky. I think it's important to separate two different grounds that the Supreme Court will consider with regard to the constitutionality of the individual mandate. One is, is an exercise of Congress's taxing and spending power, and that's what I was speaking to. And the other is an exercise of Congress's Commerce Clause authority, which is what John was speaking to. It's important to re remember that so long as the court finds that either is met, it is sufficient to uphold the individual mandate. With regard to the taxing and spending power, I think the appeal of that to the Supreme Court is they avoid the need for the question of, well, what's the limit on the scope of Congress's commerce power? And one thing to remember, since 1936, now one federal tax or spending program has been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Now, John wants to address the commerce power, so I want to do so as well. It's important here that we start with what's the law. And I think John and Hugh and I would all agree that the law is that, in part, Congress can regulate economic activities that have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And I think we'd agree that's the statement of the law. And so there's two questions with regard to the commerce power. First, is Congress regulating economic activity? And second, if so, well then taken cumulatively, does a substantial effect on the economy? The United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, as John points out, declared this unconstitutional. What John didn't tell you is two other federal courts of appeals, the United States Court of Appeals for the 6th Circuit and the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit upheld the individual mandate. And what they said was that everyone is engaged in economic activity when it comes to health care. We're all going to need health care at some point. If we have children, they have to be vaccinated before going to school. If somebody has a cunical disease, the government can require that it be treated. If somebody's in an accident, they're taken by the ambulance to the local emergency room, which is by federal law required to provide treatment. So everyone in this country is engaged in either self-insuring or purchasing health insurance. But either way, it's economic activity. And then the question is, taken cumulatively, does a substantial effect on the economy? 
health care is $2.6 trillion of the economy. It's 18% of the gross domestic product. Health insurance is an $850 billion industry. The last Supreme Court case to deal with Congress's commerce power was Gonzalez versus Raich in 2005. There, the Supreme Court held that it's constitutional under the commerce power for Congress to criminally prohibit cultivation and possession of small amounts of marijuana for personal medicinal use. If Congress can make it a crime for Angela Raich to grow marijuana for her own personal use, hard to believe that Congress can't regulate an $850 billion industry. Finally, I think that John took President Obama's statement out of context. What President Obama said, and I can quote, is that if the Supreme Court declares the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional, it will be, quote, unprecedented judicial activism. Now, we can argue over that, but that's not an attack on judicial review. It's not an attack on the court. And I don't think it will have the slightest effect on Anthony Kennedy. Anthony Kennedy made up his mind long before President Obama spoke, and whatever President Obama expressed wasn't going to persuade Anthony Kennedy one way or the other. I have great regard for him. He'll decide this a matter of constitutional law. Dean Eastman. Yeah, so um, we're going to get into the nuances a little bit of Commerce Clause jurisprudence, uh, but there's a huge difference between the Affordable Care Act case and the medical marijuana case. And the difference is uh, there is an underlying regulation of interstate commerce at issue in the medical marijuana case, that the restriction on homegrown marijuana here in California was necessary to further. We have a prohibition against interstate shipment of marijuana and other illegal drugs. Uh, and if I uh, don't allow for a prohibition on the homegrown marijuana, which is indistinguishable uh, from the, the interstate marijuana, then my ability to enforce the interstate ban on the shipment of marijuana goes away. So it's part of the necessary and proper power, a valid means to support the regulation of the interstate commerce. There's no interstate commerce at issue in the Affordable Care Act. I don't, I don't zip over to Nevada or to Nebraska or to New York to get my medical care. I go to the local doctor. It's one of the reasons why medical care has always been the primary responsibility of the states. But without that interstate hook, I don't get to use the necessary and proper clause, which is where the substantial effect on commerce issues arise, in order to validate the regulation. I have to have a regulation of interstate commerce in the first place. And so if you go back and listen to the oral argument or read the transcripts, you'll find a lot of discussions about necessary and proper, not about commerce or interstate commerce itself, trying to figure out th that connection. And it's just that issue that I think the justices are looking at. Uh, and it's also one of the reasons why, predictably now, nobody n any longer contends that Justice Scalia is going to be likely to vote to uphold the Affordable Care Act. And yet, before it got to the court, an oral argument, because Justice Scalia voted to uphold the federal regulation of homegrown medical marijuana in the race case, that Justice Scalia would probably be voting to uphold the Affordable Care Act as well. So if Scalia sees the difference between the two and no inconsistency between his vote in race and a vote to strike down the Affordable Care Act, I think there's a pretty serious principle at stake that these cases are dramatically different. Now, is that enough to persuade Justice Kennedy and Chief Justice Roberts? That's the real critical question uh, and, the, and the crux of the matter. Um, but, but, but it's clear for the originalists on the court that there is a dramatic difference between a regulation of commerce that of uh, regulation of interstate commerce, and then the kind of collateral things you need to do to support that regulation, and a regulation that doesn't begin with an interstate commerce hook uh, from the first place. To allow the regulation in this case without that interstate commerce hook is to, is to answer Justice Kennedy's initial question, if we accept your rationale, is there anything Congress cannot do? In the negative. And of course, that's to destroy the notion that ours is a limited government with only certain enumerated powers. Let me. Uh by the way, you don't know how hard this is for me to do. Uh, I just sit here and go, but how many of you are lawyers? Yeah, see? And keep your hand in the air if you've argued before the Supreme Court. All right, we have, we have one other? Yeah, one back there. Very interesting. Okay, you might be a question asked of you at some point. Uh, I would like, you both have been talking about Anthony Kennedy, and you're both experienced Supreme Court litigators. You've gone and done something that very few people have ever done, and you've addressed the nine trying to persuade them. 
Did the arguments in this case, in your opinion, have any impact on Justice Kennedy? Because Erwin, you just said something about he had made his mind up long before. And so is it all for the benefit of the non-lawyers? Is it all a circus or does it really matter? You never know. <laughs> As a lawyer, you just don't know whether your argument or your briefs are gonna make any difference. Um, the last case I argued in the Supreme Court, I lost eight to nothing. And the only reason eight to nothing is Justice O'Connor had retired before the opinion <laughs> came down. Um, I could have let my now 13-year-old daughter argue the case and it would have come out the exact same way. <laughs> On the other hand, if you talk to experienced judges, some say there are cases where oral arguments in the briefs matter. We'll never know whether they mattered in this case or not. Um, we can never know in most cases whether they matter or not. All you can do as a lawyer is write the best brief you can and do the best argument you can and take advantage of the opportunity, try to answer their questions the best of your ability. Yeah, one of the most astounding things about argument in the Supreme Court that, that um, the unexperienced lawyer will experience walking in there for the first time, um, a lawyer that goes to argue the Supreme Court has probably had oral arguments at courts of appeals elsewhere in the country, either in the state courts of appeal or the federal United States uh, circuit courts of appeal. And in those grand rooms, uh, oftentimes they're as big as this room, and you're about halfway back in the room from the bench. Uh, when you get to the Supreme Court, you're closer than that front row is. Um, and, and, I mean, and, and you can't see all nine justices at the same time. You have to turn, turn your head to be able to see them all. You're in the pit right there in front of them. And it, that can be rather dramatic and intimidating. And, and, and the other thing that's become in, uh, increasingly common at the court is the justices are having a conversation among themselves, using you as the pig, as the as the as the as the as the, as the, as the kicking board. Uh, Justice Scalia wants to ask Ginsburg a question, and you know he directs it through you back to her, and and vice versa. And and I remember on my argument, uh, Justice Scalia kept hammering on a point. He says, "Why won't you concede that point? It's so clearly right." I said, "Justice Scalia, I may agree with you, and when we go to AVs to have a pizza next time, I'll tell you that. But if I do it right now, I'm going to lose Justice Kennedy and Justice O'Connor, and I can't afford to do that." <laughs> Justice Stevens weighed in and says, "Well, you've lost me already." I said, "I wasn't going to get you in the first place." So. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and, there, and there's that kind of banter that goes on among the justices, but they, as a law clerk up there, the thing that surprised me most was that they don't have a conference among themselves before oral argument and a rather truncated discussion even after oral argument. See, I would have thought that they meet ahead of time, like many three-judge panels in the circuit courts of appeals do, to see where the areas of disagreement are and then narrow their discussion at oral argument. That never happens at the Supreme Court. And so the first time they have to take the measure of each other and what their positions are and what they're thinking about the legal issues is in that oral argument. So they're exploring as much their own views with respect to each other as they are trying to press the logic and implications of the advocate's position at the podium. Now I want to ask you both, um, the most disturbing moment of that argument, you've listened to it, I played most of it on the radio, many of you have heard most of the argument, uh, came when Justice Scalia asked, do you expect me to read these 2,600 pages? I'm not going to read this. I'm not going to ask my clerk to read them. And I looked down at, at Terry, my boss, if, he was, if there was a 2,600 page operating manual for KRLA, or at General Spees, if there's a 2,600 page uh, operating manual for the, the MEF, and they didn't read it, uh, I would be profoundly upset. And I believed him. Now, uh, Irwin, don't you think and I don't want to put words in How do you react to that comment? I think there's a difference between reading a statute line by line and reading a statute to get a sense of what's in the statute. And I think all Justice Scalia was saying there is, I'm not going to read every word of this statute. And frankly, he doesn't need to to be able to understand. I'll give you an example. One part of the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act requires nutritional disclosure by chain restaurants. Another provision of it extends funding for Native American health care programs. He doesn't need to read the specifics of those provisions in order to be able to deal with the issues that are before the Supreme Court. And I think that's all he was saying. John? And, 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 and plus, it's not just the 2,700 pages, but if you've ever read a statute in its unvarnished form, it's, it's, it, it's incoherent. 
you have to have the entire U.S. code laid out in front of you because it, it, it says the third sentence of the fourth paragraph of Section 8 of Title 16 uh, shall be changed in the following way. You have no idea what they're talking about unless you pull up Section 404 of Title 16. And so you have to have this constant reference back and forth to even make sense out of the statute. 2,700 pages of that may well violate the Eighth Amendment, as Justice Scalia suggested. That's the ban on cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> But, but it's not that he's not going to read it and his clerks aren't going to figure out section by section on if the mandate is unconstitutional, how much else of the statute do we have to strike down as well? Or can the mandate be severed and only that part cut off? And there are some parts of the statute that would clearly have to fall as well. The, 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 the uh, imposition on insurance companies, the must carry rules that every insurance company has to provide you insurance whether you, you know, even after after you're sick and show up on their door with the sick asking that to be taken care of, that, that, that would bankrupt the insurance industry uh, if, if that doesn't fall as well. Think about your auto insurance. I, I have a rule that you don't have to have auto insurance, but if I get in an accident, I then go call Allstate, they have to now add me to the policy and cover that accident I just had. How many of you would buy insurance before the accident if that was true? Right? So that part of it would have to be cut out as well with the individual mandate. But there are other things, uh, some completely unrelated provisions that probably don't need to fall. Uh, uh, and the issue there is major section by major section, can we decide what needs to be severed and what not? And that, you anticipated where I was going with my 2,600 page question, and I'll start with you, Erwin. If, in fact, you're wrong and the individual mandate does topple, what goes with it and how will the court decide? For an audience mostly of laymen, how do they decide that? The question is technically called severability. The issue is, is the unconstitutional provision severable from the rest of the statute. And the question is one of congressional intent. The issue is, would Congress have adopted the rest of the statute without this provision? And the state of Florida says to the Supreme Court that the individual mandate is the linchpin for the law. Congress wouldn't have adopted the statute without the individual mandate. Some statutes actually have what's called a severability clause that says if one provision is declared unconstitutional, don't strike down the rest of the statute. This law does not have a severability clause. And the state of Florida therefore says, in light of that, the whole statute should be declared unconstitutional. On the other hand, the United States says, as we've just pointed out, this is a 2,700 page law. It has many things that have nothing to do with the individual mandate like changing Medicare reimbursements to save costs, like nutritional disclosure by chain restaurants, like extending funding for Native American health care. I think if the Supreme Court strikes down the individual mandate, they will strike down a few other provisions that are linked to it, but not strike down the whole statute. And John identifies correctly what those provisions are. The prohibition against insurance companies having pre-existing condition clauses. I am very sensitive to this. I was diagnosed with cancer in the fall of 1982. I had surgery. I went through several months of radiation treatment. I then moved to California in the fall of 1983 to take a job at the University of Southern California. I couldn't get health insurance. The University of Southern California health care coverage would not provide it for me because I was a cancer sufferer. Um, to me, one of the best things of the uh, Affordable Care Act is it eliminates pre-existing condition clauses to make those uh, like me who have had things like cancer be able to get health insurance. Another thing that the, that the Affordable Care Act does is it eliminates caps on benefits in years or in lifetime. It says the insurance company can't put a cap on how much it's going to cover in a year or a lifetime. If you talk to anyone who's familiar with bankruptcy courts, they would tell you that a significant number of people in bankruptcy court are there because of medical bills, because of insurance company caps. That too, I think, will be declared unconstitutional if the individual mandate is declared unconstitutional. In fact, the United States government has even conceded that these provisions would have to fall because the way in which insurance companies will be able to pay for not having pre-existing condition clauses or not having caps is through the additional coverage for the individual mandate. So when we think about what this could mean for all of our lives, some provisions that really benefit many of us will be struck down if the individual mandate goes as well. And John, as we transition out of Obamacare to the other issues before us, I'd like you both to speak and have you 
tee off on this, on the importance of this case in the history of the court and whether or not its decision will signal anything significant beyond the terms of the case or whether it will be one of those cases about which we mark the beginning or the ending of an era on the court. You know, um, you, you look at the tectonic discussion going on, not just the court, not just in the court uh, and not just among lawyers, but among the citizenry generally about the relative role of government, the national government versus the states, or government generally versus individual citizens. Uh, and this, this case has become symbolic of that larger fight in our society. I think uh, Justice Breyer asked a question during an argument that really indicates uh, to me that the, the stakes uh, of this fight and how much m m more broad they are than just the fight over the health care bill. He said to Paul Clement at one point in the argument on, on that Tuesday, the mandate day, but do you think you can, better than the actuaries or better than the members of Congress who worked on it, look at the 40 million people who are not insured and say which ones will or will not use emergency care next year? Now it seems to me that kind of pits the divide in the country in fairly stark terms. Justice Breyer comes from an assumption that the government knows better how we ought to order our lives on such fundamental questions. How much risk to take, how much to mitigate that risk by how much insurance we decide to buy, how much to swap insurance purchases versus food and, and, and shelter or golf or anything else we decide to spend our money on. Uh, the government that is powerful enough to have uh, such a, a demand on its citizens that they know better than they do is a very arrogant government. But if it's powerful enough to make good on those paternalistic tendencies, it is necessarily going to become a despotic and tyrannical government. And it seems to me this case presents that basic divide in very stark terms. And it's why people have gotten so exercised over it, even beyond the concern about their health care system. That's what's at stake in this case. And it really is pretty fundamental if the court is going to stand up to an excessive claim of power beyond anything that's ever been done before um, uh, and, and strike it down and fulfill its role that I think the founders envisioned of checking uh, excessive uh, claims of power by the Congress. Erwin is going to disagree with that, I bet. <laughs> I disagree. Um, when Social Security was proposed in the 1930s, the arguments against it were exactly what John said. And when Medicare was proposed in the 1960s, the arguments against it were exactly what John just said. Now, I start from a different premise, and that's there are 50 million people in this country without access to health care. How do we solve that problem? And what the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act does is say, since we're all going to need health care at some point, we all should be part of paying for the health care system. I don't see that as any different than the Social Security system or any different than what Medicare does. Now, you asked a specific question, and your question was, how important will the Supreme Court's decision be as to the future of constitutional law or larger social issues. Tell me what the Supreme Court does and how they write the opinion, and then I'll tell you how important it's going to be. Because they could write the opinion in a way that I don't think is very legally significant. They could write the opinion in a way that's truly earth-shattering within the field of constitutional law. I don't think it's we see the result, and we see how the opinions are written, we can assess what the effect of the decision is going to be. Gentlemen, second subject. Take a deep breath. Relax. Because in the 12 years that we've been doing this, there's been one constant, uh, and that is shortly after we began, America went to war. And one of the most interesting things about all the conversations that we have had, and they now number, they now number more than 500 conversations between John and Irwin on the air. Uh, a recurring conversation has been about uh, the rights and powers of the president in wartime and about the treatment of the combatants who are uh, taken from the battlefield or in other circumstances. Um, uh, these have often been heated conversations. It doesn't mean that we lose civility, but they have been heated. And so the question is, where have we been these 10 years? Where are we now? And where are we going? And what does the court, uh, their conduct over these 10 years, how do you summarize it? John, I'll, I'll let you take this one first. Yeah, I, I think in the series, uh, a trilogy of war on terror cases that were handed down early part of the last decade, a couple years after 
the court embarked upon a second guessing of executive authority in wartime in an unprecedented way. Uh, it for the first time held, for example, that uh, combatants detained overseas could have access to the civilian courts to assess the validity of their detention uh, as combatants uh, in a prisoner of war camp or otherwise. No court in our history had ever done that before. Um, uh, they, they did it with American citizens overseas, they did it with non-citizens held overseas, um, uh, and they did it even after the president issued declarations that this was a combatant, lawful or unlawful combatant. And that meant the courts were going to be in the role for the first time of second-guessing military decisions in detention, trying to find evidence to support the detention claim um, when those detentions were often uh, uh, occurred during the fog of the field of battle. Uh, we have stories uh, about uh, our, our men and women on arms at added risk because of the insistence that they gather the evidence necessary that would support the claims against the petition for habeas corpus to release the combatants. That's never happened before in our history. And, and the, the, the court embarked upon something there that I think it was ill-equipped institutionally to embark upon. Um, I think this past Monday, recognizing that, it took almost a decade to come to full fruition, but I think this past Monday, recognizing that, the court backed away. And, and on Monday, there were seven petitions for habeas corpus. This is the petition by the prisoners in Guantanamo to free them because the government ought not to have the authority to detain us. A couple of the trial judges, the district, federal district judges, had granted those habeas petitions and were going to release the combatants, the heart, most hardened of the hardened in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and we're going to release them either into this country or back to their home countries. The Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit said no. They refused to grant any of the habeas petitions, and those cases were all before the Supreme Court for review. And on Monday, the Supreme Court denied review in all of them without a single vote of dissent. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't dissenters on the opinion, but none of them took the time to write a dissent from the denial of certiorari. And while that's normally not something that warrants conversation because it doesn't mean anything. In a case uh, such as those that are such high profile, one would have expected to see a dissent from the denial of certiorari if some of the justices were really adamant about it. And I think, I think at least for now, those, this, that decision on Monday means the court is backing away from interfering with that executive decision making in the conduct of war, taking the position that historically the court had taken heretofore. In January 2002, I filed the first lawsuit in the United States on behalf of the Guantanamo detainees. I argued it in federal court in February of 2002 and the Federal Court of Appeals in the summer of 2002. And we discussed that at length on your program at the time. In the summer of 2002, I began representing a man in Guantanamo by the name of Salim Garebi. Now, Garebi may be a very dangerous man, or he may be, like many people, there by mistake. Grebby has been in Guantanamo over 10 years, and he's never had a trial. How do we, how does any civilized society decide if somebody is guilty or dangerous? You provide a trial. There are 169 individuals still in Guantanamo. None of them have been tried yet. And so how long is this going to go on? How long will it be that we will hold individuals without providing some semblance of due process? To me, that's really the question. Now, I disagree with John here on two levels. First, I think the Supreme Court decisions he alludes to in the last decade were absolutely right. Because what the Supreme Court was saying is that even in a time of crisis, even in the context of war and terror, we have to follow the rule of law. In 2004, in Rasul versus Bush, the Supreme Court ruled six to three that those who are held in Guantanamo have a right of access to federal court via habeas corpus. I should point out that both Justice O'Connor and Kennedy, not liberal justices, were in the majority. And almost exactly four years ago to the day, on June 12, 2008, in Bomadien versus Bush, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional a federal law 
the Military Commission Act, which said that those who are held in Guantanamo can't have access to federal court via habeas corpus. Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court there, and he stressed that the Constitution allows the suspension of habeas corpus only in times of rebellion or invasion. The United States didn't claim that was present here. And he ended his opinion by saying how important it is that we follow the rule of law even in times of crisis. The second thing I disagree with John about is his characterizing what happened on Monday, and I'm going to use his word, as a decision. All of us know that there's an enormous difference between the Supreme Court denying review and the Supreme Court issuing a decision. The Supreme Court denied review. That could simply mean they're waiting for another vehicle, a different case, that they will better oppose the issue. So I don't read as much into it as John does that the Supreme Court didn't take these cases. We'll see in time whether or not this is just a prelude to other cases they take. I fear, though, that there may be something to what John says, and I think it's more general. I think that we as a society across the political spectrum have simply lost interest in those in Guantanamo. That when President Bush was in office, the left was willing to criticize him for Guantanamo policy. But unfortunately, the left has not been similarly willing to criticize President Obama for keeping Guantanamo open, and they should. And I will hear. President Obama promised to close Guantanamo within a year, in part because of Congress, and in part because I think laws, lack of political will, he hasn't done so. And he hasn't tried these individuals either. And I fear the Supreme Court has likewise lost interest in this. These are 169 human beings who've been in prison for over a decade. Maybe they're guilty, maybe they're innocent, but how does any civilized society know except by providing them a trial? A related but distinct question, not presently before the court, but which um, certainly must weigh heavily on their mind, concerns the war-making power. We are here at the Nixon Library. One of the articles of impeachment referred against the president was for the secret bombing of Cambodia, if you recall. It's also uh, very interesting to me that we have in our front row not merely a general, I don't mean merely general, but a general, but also Corporal Bateman, Marine veteran of, uh, of Iraq, going to come to work for me in the fall. So we've got two people who've actually made it part of their lives to be war and other warriors here. Now the Commander-in-Chief is exercising day-by-day -day decision on whom to kill with drones and whom not to kill with drones. I wonder about both of your reactions as to whether or not uh, Article 2 was so intended and whether the court will find a way to review that. Erwin, I'll let you go first on this one. Sure. When Richard Nixon was president, Congress passed what's called the War Powers Resolution. President Nixon vetoed it and Congress overrode the veto. And I think the War Powers Resolution was absolutely right. The idea of the War Powers Resolution is that we shouldn't get into a protracted war without congressional approval. That I think the genius of the Constitution is that for almost any important action, two branches of government have to be involved. So in order to go to war, there has to be both the declaration by Congress and the President as Commander-in-Chief waging war. Certainly in emergencies, there can be action by the President that's recognized in the War Powers Resolution. I think the actions of both President Bush and Obama have been inconsistent with the War Powers Resolution. In terms of drones specifically, I think it's very troubling under international law to use drones for targeted assassination, though I think that's a different question from the War Powers Resolution. Yeah, uh, boy, some area of agreement, so write this day down in the calendars. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think the president has more authority to act unilaterally than Irwin does, I mean, the area of disagreement. And I think the war powers resolution intrudes on that presidential power. The president has some powers as commander in chief that he has directly from the Constitution. And it's an open question and one that's never been challenged in court, partly because members of Congress are fearful that the answer will be they didn't have that power, uh, to pass a resolution that constrains the president's exercise of his commander in chief power. Hours. It's pretty clear, for example, that Congress could not, in uh, June of 1944, have directed the president to land troops in Belgium instead of on the, on the coast of Normandy. And my son, who's at the Air Force Academy now, said this summer, we want to visit France. I want to see those beaches at Normandy. Uh, so a, a, a hat tip to all of the Air Force parents that are out there. Uh, General, I know that's not your branch, but uh, it's, it's ours now. Um, 
the, the, the president, though, is constrained in somewhat um, by, 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 by act of Congress. Congress here, though, did give the necessary authority to the conduct of the war to anybody that launched or harbored or was involved or supported the acts that led to the attack on us on 9-11. The authorization for the use of force that Congress passed after 9-11 is extremely broad. And the President's exercise of his authority under that authorization, when combined with the authority he has directly from the Constitution, is more than adequate to the task to take out the chain of command of our enemies, as he is doing. My disagreement with the drones is a tactical one. Not a, not a constitutional one. I think the reason he's doing it is not because it's the most effective way to take out our enemy. I think the reason he's doing it is because it's political. He doesn't want to have to confront detaining and interrogating those people who might provide fonts of intelligence information given the campaign he ran against the interrogations that went on in the prior administration. And if that's the reason we're doing it, we are losing valuable information in the most important front in the current war that we're involved with. An asymmetrical war means we have to defend against a thousand points and they only have to hit one. The only way you can win in an asymmetrical war is by superior intelligence. And if the drone campaign is taking that off the table, it is costing us dearly in our long-term survival in this war. So I disagree tactically, but I think he has the authority to attack the chain of command. Roman numeral number three. The Supreme Court will be handing down in the next two to three weeks a decision on Arizona SB 1070 of great concern not merely to our audience next week in Arizona but to every American. John, would you set up what it is, what it does, and whether you believe it should be and will be upheld? So uh, I'm not sure there's anybody in America that hasn't been following the Arizona SB 1070 uh, controversy. Arizona uh, has, has been in many ways overrun with, with excessive illegal immigration, in part pushed that direction because of the partial fence along the border that was built on the California portion of the border. It just shifted the illegal immigration problem over to Arizona. Um, but it's become increasingly bad. Uh, it's, it's affecting their economy. It's affecting their ecosystems. Uh, it's affecting their lives and their property. Um, the former chairman of the Orange County Lincoln Club here, his brother-in-law, was one of the ranchers that was murdered uh, as a result of the non-enforcement of, of immigration laws. I mean, there are parts of Arizona that are occupied by, by, by foreign militias. Uh, the state of Arizona finally had had enough, and the people asked their legislature to adopt method, measures that they thought constitutionally could, would allow the state to weigh in. And what the state did there, I think constitutionally, this is the, the issue before the court, is authorized their state and local law enforcement to assist in the enforcement of federal immigration law. They did not create their own immigration law. They have no constitutional authority to do so. The power under our Constitution to, to create naturalization and immigration policy is exclusively given to Congress. But the Supreme Court has also recognized that the states have the ability to regulate domestic relations within their state. Employment relations, housing, and all of these other things that are impacted pretty severely by massive waves of illegal immigration. The question is, have they gone so far in doing that to amount to a new immigration policy itself different than what Congress enacted, or are they simply adding resources to the enforcement game to try and facilitate enforcement of existing federal immigration law? And, and posed that way, I think it's pretty clear that the court is going to uphold the Arizona statute. Now, there are a couple of relatively minor provisions of it where they've embarked upon creating a separate state law crime for violating what's also a crime in federal law. And those provisions might be struck down because they really do add to the federal scheme. And the Supreme Court has said you can't do that if you're a state. But for the rest of the statute and the more controversial provisions, I think what they did is perfectly constitutional. And it will add a whole army of law enforcement to the uh, anti-illegal immigration enforcement efforts that may help Arizona get a handle on that border and start whittling away some of the collateral damage that's occurring to its citizens and lawful residents as a result of that illegal immigration. And your prediction on the vote? I think five to four. Five to four to uphold most of the provisions of the statute. Dean Chemerinsky. I am absolutely sure that won't be because Justice Kagan's not participating. 
Yep, sorry, 5-3, uh, five, 5-3. Three, five, three. Um, didn't mean corrected. to make a smart aleck response, but <laughs> couldn't resist. Um, she shouldn't be. You know. <laughs> it's the one thing I could say. That, um, I actually want to go back to your question of what the issues are before the court, because I think you need to know them in order to be able to assess what you think is likely to happen. Arizona SB 1070 declares in its preamble to decrease the presence in the state of undocumented immigrants through aggressive law enforcement and attrition. In the summer of 2010, Judge Susan Bolton, federal judge in Arizona, issued a preliminary injunction as to four provisions of SB 1070, and that's what's before the Supreme Court now. One provision says that if police officers have reasonable suspicion that a person is illegal in the United States, they can then check to see the person's immigration status. A second provision requires that non-citizens carry papers with them at all times showing that they're lawfully in the country. A third provision makes it a crime in Arizona for persons not lawfully in the United States to apply for or receive employment in the state. And a fourth provision says that if the police have probable cause that the individual is not lawfully in the country, they can detain the individual and that as to any person arrested, their immigration status has to be checked before they're released. We'd agree that's what the, the bill says. Now, if we're going to talk about what the Supreme Court's going to do, I think you have to focus on prior Supreme Court cases in this area. In the leading Supreme Court case, a case called Hines versus Davidowitz in 1942, it involved a Pennsylvania law that in many ways is like the Arizona law. The Pennsylvania law required that non-citizens carry with them at all times papers showing they're lawful in the country. It also required that they register with the state of Pennsylvania, a number of other things. The Supreme Court said that the Pennsylvania law was preempted by federal law, precluded by federal law. And the Supreme Court said, and here I quote verbatim, that states cannot, I'm quoting, contradict or complement federal immigration enforcement. The Supreme Court said that any enforcement with regard to immigration has foreign policy consequences, and states are not allowed to have their own foreign policies. So what's the Supreme Court likely to do with regard to these four provisions? My own sense from having read the transcript of the oral argument, and now I'm predicting, not arguing to what I think it should be, I think the Supreme Court's going to uphold some of the provisions and strike some of them down. I think the court will uphold the provision that allows the police to question individuals about immigration status if there's reasonable suspicion they're not lawfully in the country. Now, how that can be enforced without it turning on the race of individuals, I'm not sure, but that's not the issue before the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court will strike down the part of the Arizona law that requires that non-citizens carry papers with them at all times, proving that they're lawfully in the country. That's exactly what the Supreme Court invalidated in Hines versus Davidowitz. I think the Supreme Court will strike down the part of the law that says it's a crime in Arizona for non-citizens to apply for or receive employment. The reason is when Congress created the federal immigration law, it considered doing that, but decided instead to put all sanctions on employers, not on workers, and I think it will be preempted. And I think the Supreme Court will say it's fine for the state to check immigration status to those arrested, but there cannot be indefinite detention of those who are believed to be illegally in the United States. So I think it's going to be mixed. The only other thing that I'd say is keep in mind since there's eight justices, there's the possibility of a 4-4 split on one or more of these issues. And if the Supreme Court splits 4-4, it means the lower court is upheld by an evenly divided court, and the lower court struck down all of these provisions. Roman numeral number five. Hang on, let me, let me, let me respond to that. I know we've got to go quick, but the, 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 the issue from Hines versus Davidovitz is a little more nuanced. Pennsylvania created a different set of rules than the federal government had. Arizona has adopted and mirrored exactly the federal policy. It's a violation of federal law to not carry your immigration papers at any time if you are in the United States lawfully. Arizona simply said it, it is a state law crime to not comply with the federal law. Now, that creates an added 
sanction potentially, and it might be that that strikes it down, but it's not because Arizona has done something with respect to carrying of immigration papers that the federal law doesn't identically do. They went out of their way to mirror, not, not just using the language, they didn't even use the language at all. They just said if it violates, if you are carrying papers, not, or not carrying papers as required by this provision of federal law. They referenced the federal law and incorporated it in the state law. And so I think that makes it different than that old case. And, and if you look at the Supreme Court's decision last term in a related case called Chamber of Commerce versus Whiting, where Arizona did the same thing, adopt the rules and the language and the terminology and the definitions of the federal law dealing with the employment relationship, and the court goes out of its way to say because they have mirrored federal law rather than creating a separate statutory requirement, it was valid. And I think that, that, that puts this in a different context, why I'm more confident that we're going to have five votes to uphold most of the provisions. Any comment on that, Erwin? Sure. First, Chamber of Commerce versus Whiting was a totally different situation. The federal immigration law says that states cannot impose penalties on employers who employ undocumented immigrants except in the area of licensing. And the question was, was an Arizona law that revokes incorporation for companies that employ undocumented immigrants licensing within the meaning of the statute. And so that was about interpreting a specific word in a particular statute that was thought to expressly preempt state law. That's not the issue in this case. And so that's why none of the justices in their questioning and none of the briefs talked about that case. But second, well, John may be right that with regard to the carry papers, the Supreme Court might say that's permissible. Um, it is notable the court struck down the Pennsylvania law that did that. And I think from John's own reasoning, the penalties on workers who apply for or receive employment in Arizona would have to be preempted in his analysis because there's nothing in federal law that does that. And Congress made the conscious choice not to impose any sanctions on the employees, only to put the sanctions on employers. So I think by his analysis, that would clearly be preempted. Roman numeral number five. Irwin mentioned race. I know for a fact that there are in this audience 18-year-olds who will be applying for college next semester. I know that there are university students who will be applying to grad schools. I said rage, and we're talking about that. <laughs> <Not right. laughs> and I want to know whether or not the rules under which their applications will be reviewed will be significantly different at the end of the next term. We're moving into the prospective assessment of what the Supreme Court is going to do in the next term, including the University of Texas case. Erwin, would you tell people what the stakes are and what you expect will happen? The Supreme Court has granted review, oral arguments will be next October, in a case called Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. The issue before the Supreme Court is whether colleges and universities may continue to use race as one fact among many in admissions decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. In 2003, in Grutter versus Bollinger, the Supreme Court ruled five to four that colleges and universities have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body. And thus the Supreme Court said that colleges and universities can use race as one factor among many to enhance diversity and benefit minorities. The Supreme Court echoed what Justice Lewis Powell had said 25 years earlier in Regents of the University of California versus Bakke. The Supreme Court decision in Grutter versus Bollinger was written by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. It was joined by Justices Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. Replacing Stevens and Souter with Kagan and Sotomayor, respectively, isn't going to change anybody's the outcome of the case. Everyone believes that Sotomayor and Kagan will vote the same way that Stevens and Souter did. But replacing Sandra Day O'Connor with Samuel Alito here, like in so many areas, is going to make an enormous difference. In fact, in 2007, in a case called Parents Involved in Community Schools, for Seattle School District Number 1, Justice Alito joined an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts that said that the Constitution requires colorblindness and that any use of race to benefit minorities violates the Constitution. I think all three of us would agree that there are five votes to limit maybe even five votes to overrule Grutter versus Bollinger. It's just the question of how far Justice Kennedy is willing to go here. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Although I will say this, in the Parents United case, um, 
when Justice O'Connor had left and been replaced by Justice Alito, um, Anthony Kennedy shifted to the left a bit. He didn't hear, adhere to the same position he had outlined uh, in the Grutter versus Bollinger case. He made it a little bit more up for grabs. And so he's now a pivotal vote in a way that if you just look at the votes in, in, in Grutter, you would think that he was not. Um, uh, he, I think, likes being in that center chair and in that pivotal vote, and he clearly is here. There are a couple of differences. The court could strike down the Texas Affirmative Action Plan without overruling Grutter versus Bollinger. Bollinger. That would be a very narrow decision. But because the Texas plan goes further than the Michigan Law School did in Grutter, it insists on diversity, not just university-wide or campus-wide, but classroom-wide and curricular area-wide. And it's also uh, uh, driven by obligations for accrediting agencies and whatever, not the academic judgment of the faculty and the administration that played so important a role in the court's decision that having diversity is, according to the academics, a compelling interest that we need to defer to them on. That doesn't exist in the Texas case, at least not to the same extent, or it's a much uh, uh, more contested ground. So they could uh, keep Grutter in place and strike down the Texas plan. Um, but I tend to think they took this case to do something more than that, and that is to say Grutter didn't make any sense when it was written. Justice O'Connor herself acknowledged that the constitutional rule may change in another quarter century. I think that quarter century timeline may be advanced, and I think we may reverse Grutter altogether and say it's finally time to give us John Marshall Harlan's uh, famous dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, w where we, we judge people um, uh, that we know no class among our citizens and no race. Ours is a colorblind society. Roman numeral six, and the last Roman numeral before we turn for a few questions from the audience. And I want to say uh, at the beginning of this, I want to thank Terry for being one of the uh, general managers in the Salem Radio Network who is willing to roll the dice and say that an audience would come out to hear a conversation like this. And I'd like to thank all of you for doing it. How many of you are getting your money's worth thus far? Right. Very, very good. One of, the, um, one of the things I like about the smart guys is I can trust either of them to establish what the law is before they debate it. In other words, they will fairly and accurately represent what the situation is on the ground before they begin to disagree over what's going to happen. And, uh, and so now I raise two cases. The Ninth Circuit's recent decision to strike down Proposition 8 and the First Circuit's recent decision to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act. Erwin, could you tell us what the bases of those two decisions are and when you expect it to go to the court and then what you think is going to happen. But first, just where we are. Sure. Um, Perry versus Brown was the challenge to California's Proposition 8. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in a two to one decision declared this unconstitutional. The Ninth Circuit said that California, through the decision of the California Supreme Court in May of 2008, had extended marriage to include both heterosexual and same-sex couples. The effect of Proposition 8 was to take away the fundamental right to marry to just one group, same-sex couples, while leaving it in place for heterosexual couples. The Ninth Circuit said there's no legitimate government interest served by taking this right away from just same-sex couples when allowing it to be there for opposite-sex couples. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit a week ago Tuesday denied what's called en banc review of the whole court having the opportunity to hear the case. Two weeks ago, the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit in Gill versus Office of Personnel Management declared unconstitutional Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, which says that for purposes of federal law, such as for federal benefits, marriage has to be between a man and a woman. The United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit talked about how marriage has traditionally been left to the state governments to regulate. The First Circuit said, therefore, there's reason to be more suspicious of a federal law. And the First Circuit said there wasn't a sufficient government interest to justify this provision of the Defense of Marriage Act. And I think all of us would agree that that's what the court said in the cases. Um, uh, your next question was, what, is, what do I think the court is going to do? I think the court is likely to take 
both of these cases. I think they will be briefed and argued separately. Um, in terms of timing, the party that loses in a federal court of appeals has 90 days to seek Supreme Court review. The other side then gets 30 days to oppose Supreme Court review. And there's a short time for reply. That means that both of these cases are likely to get to the Supreme Court for consideration of whether to be heard early next fall. As I said, I think the Supreme Court's going to take both. They'll be briefed and argued separately. They'll be heard sometime early in 2013, and they'll be decided next year around this time. Maybe if John and I are lucky, you'll invite us back and we can discuss these cases before they come back. Come down. Now my prediction for you. I've offered a number of predictions tonight, and I'll tell you, like for my prediction as to the Affordable Care Act, I offered the prediction without much confidence. I read the transcripts of the oral argument with regard to the Affordable Care Act. Justice Kennedy asked equally hard questions of both sides. And I can point to as many questions that were asked that were difficult of one side as the other in making a prediction. By contrast, I feel very confident in my prediction as to what the Supreme Court's gonna do with regard to the issue of marriage equality. I think the Supreme Court is going to rule five to four that gays and lesbians have the right to marriage equality in the Constitution, the right to express love and commitment, the right to get all the legal benefits, the right to have the joys and disappointments of marriage that heterosexual couples have always had. I think it's gonna be Justice Kennedy writing for the court, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Now, why do I feel so strong that this is what's gonna happen? I think Justice Kennedy ultimately has to face the question, does he want to write the next Plessy versus Ferguson or the next Brown versus Board of Education? Because there is no doubt where society is going on this issue. In the last decade, 12 countries around the world have legalized marriage equality. In fact, a number of states have done so in this country. According to opinion polls, a majority of Americans now for the first time favor allowing marriage equality. Among voters between 18 and 35, 70% favor marriage equality. There have been two Supreme Court cases in American history advancing rights for gays and lesbians. Romer v. Evans in 1996 and Lawrence v. Texas in 2003. Do you know who wrote both of those opinions for the United States Supreme Court? Anthony Kennedy. And I think Anthony Kennedy is going to simply say, there's no legitimate government interest in keeping gays and lesbians from being able to marry. I think in essence what the Supreme Court's gonna to say, to those who don't like the idea of same-sex marriage, don't marry someone of the same sex. But there's no government interest in keeping gays and lesbians from being able to express love and commitment through marriage. John Eastman. I disagree. Actually, actually uh, on the prediction, I fear that he may be right. Um, but on the uh, merits of whether that's right or not, I think uh, I disagree vehemently. Um, we're not talking about marriage equality. We are talking about dramatically altering the nature of the institution of marriage. Uh, and both decisions, the, the DOMA decision in the First Circuit and the Proposition 8 decision by the Ninth Circuit, didn't apply strict scrutiny because it found a fundamental right to marry whomever you want without regard to the opposite gender. That's never been held by any Supreme Court decision. And it didn't apply strict scrutiny because it found that gays and lesbians were a suspect class comparable to race. Either of those decisions would have been intellectually more coherent that if I apply strict scrutiny, the government has to com have a compelling interest for its classification. Uh, and, and the classification has to be narrowly tailored to further that compelling interest. That's not the basis of either decision. Both courts held that this didn't even pass the lowest level of constitutional scrutiny we give, what's called rational basis review, where if there's any conceivable reason for upholding the classification, we defer to the government. The notion that I can't conceive of a reason for keeping traditional marriage between opposite sex couples who have the possibility of procreating and then raising the children that are the offspring of that relationship, something that doesn't exist by nature in the other type of relationship, that's not a statement that evidences any hostility or animosity. It's a simple statement of biological fact. 
Uh, under rational basis review, that is more than sufficient to uphold those statutes. For the courts in both of those cases to say that this doesn't even pass rational basis review is to impose on all seven million Californians who voted for Proposition 8, the majorities in every single state, all 32 of them that have voted on this issue, uh, and the federal Congress that overwhelmingly passed DOMA in 1990s with President Clinton's signature, it's to assign to them nothing legitimate but only exercising animus and illegitimate stereotypical animus toward gays and lesbians. And in fact, it's to ascribe that animus to the entire history of Western civilization. That's what's at stake to say that there's no possible explanation for keeping traditional marriage other than hatred of gays and lesbians. I don't think Justice Kennedy is prepared to take that step. He specifically keeps the question open in Lawrence versus Texas. And he also spends a lot of time in that case pointing out how the anti-sodomy statute in Texas was a, a, a statute that existed in only a few states anymore. That's not the case with marriage. And in fact, this inevitability claim that civilization is changing. Every time it's been put to a vote, every time, to the people, traditional marriage has won out. This is not some outlier by some hick state. California voted for Proposition 8. The United States Congress <laughs> voted for the Defense of Marriage Act. I think that makes it dramatically different. Now, you can't read the tea leaves in those two opinions by Justice Kennedy to think that that reasoning, that difference... Stay calm. <laughs> You see what happens when you mess with traditional marriage. <laughs> that, could, that could end up on YouTube. <laughs> In, in, in any event, I, 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 I do share Irwin's view and what, what his optimism and my concern that the tea leaves of Justice Kennedy's opinions in both of those cases suggest that he uh, might be inclined to vote uh, to strike down Proposition 8. But the reasoning, the things he actually says in those opinions would allow him more than ample reason to distinguish the case if he so chose, and I hope that he does. Erwin, I'm going to give you the, the opportunity to interpret that event. Uh, <laughs> My field's constitutional law, not geology, so I'll stick to that. Um, I just want to make two quick points in response to John so we can get to your questions. First, most states in this country had laws that prohibited interracial marriage. California had a law that prohibited interracial marriage until it was declared unconstitutional in 1946. Almost every southern state had a law that prohibited interracial marriage until the Supreme Court in 1967 in the wonderfully aptly titled case Loving versus Virginia declared that unconstitutional. If we followed tradition, then the Supreme Court was wrong in those cases. The reality is the Supreme Court recognized that conceptions with regard to marriage do change. And the country didn't fall apart when we struck down laws that prohibit interracial marriage. And the state of Massachusetts recognized marriage equality for gays and lesbians in 2003, almost a decade ago. And the country hasn't fallen apart. It's not dramatically altering the nature of marriage to say that a same-sex couple should have the same right to express love and commitment as an opposite-sex couple. Second, John and I also disagree in terms of Justice Kennedy and his opinions. Um, it's worth noting that Romer versus Evans in 1996 involved an initiative passed by the Colorado voters that repealed all laws in the state protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination and prohibiting the enactment of any new laws protecting gays and lesbians from discrimination. Anthony Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court, it was six to three, saying there was no conceivable legitimate government interest for it. The fact there was an initiative passed by the voters didn't keep Justice Kennedy from coming to that conclusion. 
Now, I think what Justice Kennedy is going to say with regard to marriage equality is likewise, there's no legitimate interest. What's the legitimate interest that John just pointed to? Procreation. Well, we've never required for a heterosexual couple that they have the ability or desire to procreate in order to get married. More important, what John ignores is that gay and lesbian couples will procreate whether they can marry or not. Gay couples will have children through surrogacy and adoption. Lesbian couples will have children through artificial insemination and adoption. The question is, are the children of those couples better off with married or unmarried parents? If you believe that marriage is good for the stability of the family, then there really is no legitimate interest in keeping gays and lesbians from being able to marry. And I think it's exactly what Anthony Kennedy is going to say. Now I would like to, in our time remaining, where is Christian with our microphone? Um, Christian is right here. I'm going to take a question from each section. So does anyone in this section have a question? Let's come right up front here, Christian, to this lady in the red. Is it on? Oh, we don't. We, uh, Christian holds on to the mic. Okay. That's a good deal. <laughs> anyway, I have uh, uh, just a question regarding this last subject. Less than 3% of the population of the United States is uh, gays or lesbians. And as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. But why are we bending over backwards to change the rules for less than 3% and what about contract law as far as inheritance and right to possession and all of that? Why isn't that, why isn't that su suffice for, uh, for the gays and lesbians? Irwin. I don't know what the percentage is. I've heard many different estimates, including estimates that are higher than that. But I'm no more a sociologist than I am a geologist, so I'm not going to argue with you about the percentage. There are a significant number of gay and lesbian couples in this country. And the reality is that marriage confers benefits that even domestic partnership laws don't, like tax benefits. Um, they also confer in states that don't have domestic partner laws things like inheritance benefits, to use your example. And so the argument is, why shouldn't a gay couple or a lesbian couple be able to get all of those benefits of law that heterosexual couples always have. Why shouldn't they be just as entitled to equal dignity and respect under the law? Unless you believe there's something wrong with being gay and lesbian, and then that is animus, then I don't understand why we can't give them the same benefits. We give opposite sex couples. Johnny Smith. Yeah, look, you have to ask the question, why is it the government got in the business of uh, encouraging people to get married in the first place? And it's not to encourage love between the relationship. It's because the marriage institution is the best one humankind has ever discovered. Um, and for those of you in the audience who have religious faith, you know, God-given the best institution that ever been discovered for procreation and rearing the children that are the offspring of that relationship. We all know for a fact that the natural parents have a heartfelt vested interest in their kids that is insurmountable in any other relationship we know. Uh, and fostering that relationship is therefore the best way to provide the best circumstances for transmitting our cultural values to the next generation, for raising those kids in the most optimal situation. Does it happen in every relationship? Of course not. But when you're looking, particularly under rational basis review, you try and do these things that, that foster and support the most optimal thing you can. And we know that to be opposite sex marriage procreating and raising the kids that are the offspring of that marriage. We know for a fact that that's true. Uh, it's perfectly rational to then foster that institution without fostering all sorts of other different kinds of institutions that might involve different relationships. California's Proposition 8 isn't limited to a prohibition on gays and lesbian marriage. It says one man and one woman. That means you can't pick two or three wives or two or three husbands as well. Right? And, and, and th that's no animus. That just says that's not the institution that's, that we have, through human history, ascertained to be the best, the optimal, for, for doing this thing that is essential 
for carrying on civilization and, and, and the species. There's nothing wrong with that, and that's why every society in human history has gravitated toward an institution that looks an awful lot like the one we've tra 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 traditionally defined as marriage. In the trial record in Proposition 8, there is evidence from the folks that are in support of same-sex marriage that their purpose is not equality. Their purpose is to destroy the institution of marriage, to finally sever the ties between love and diapers, is one of the one of the phrases that will have a dramatic impact on a societal institution that has been so critical to our success the notion that we the people can't make the basic policy judgment of whether we're willing to experiment by throwing that off is to transfer this from a nation where the people are ultimately sovereign into something entirely different those are huge stakes Christian in uh, section two there we have young lady in the middle if you would give her the microphone. Um, I'm Molly and I actually called in on your show earlier and I had two questions if that's all right. Um, my first question is um, directed at both of you. I'm wondering, um, I'm going to do to a debate in Washington DC and I was assigned to defend President Obama in the re-election regardless of my personal beliefs. And I was wondering, <laughs> and I was wondering which do you, which point do you think is the best point to defend President Obama with? What has he done? And second question, <laughs> give it to us both. <laughs> I want your opinion too, Mr. Um, Eastman. And um, the other thing was about how um, with Medicare, how some may say that it's not something that we need. Wouldn't you be able to also say that we wouldn't need school in the same manner because we would need it in order to progress society further, to give everyone whatever opportunities they need in order to grow as a person and to help society? Would you also consider health care similar to school in that manner? All right, let's begin with John Eastman on those two questions. Yeah, so How would you defend President Obama? <laughs> he hasn't destroyed the economy as thoroughly as he might have. Um, he came to the realization that President Bush and the war on terror and keeping Gitmo open was right. Um, uh, I'm out of... <laughs> that's about as best as I can do. No, no look, um, uh, the, the, the president has, it seems to me, um, taken advantage of the recession and the war um, to expand government reach into our lives, to dramatically transform the constitutional system of government we have. Um, and, and I can't give a defense of a re-election of that because I think what would happen in the next four years may be irretrievable. Uh, we have an opportunity in November to stop it from going over that precipice and I hope all of Hugh's listeners will come to that realization by November. And on the Medicare education analogy? Yeah. Look, you know, one of the things that I think the president, prior president did that has had devastatingly bad consequences for us is the No Child Left Behind Act. The, the, <clears throat> there's a reason the founders did not have the federal government involved in such things that are locally controlled as education. Is that a one-size-fits-all destroys experimentation, it destroys competition, it bureaucratizes it and, it, and it destroys the ability to deliver those services. We're finding it in spades as the federal government has gotten more extensively involved involved in education. We didn't even have a Department of Education for the first nearly 200 years of our history, uh, and we had a much better education system than we have today. I'd rather them get out of Medicare as well as education rather than going the other direction and become more intrusive on the things that are properly left to the states or the local government or, quite frankly, no government but individual choice. Dean Chemerinsky. I'm going to start with John just ended. The idea of having the government eliminate Medicare. How many, I'm not going to ask you to show hands, in this room need Medicare for your medical care? Or how many of you have parents like my mother who depends on Medicare for her medical care? It's stunning to me that we could even be here in 2012 and talk about eliminating Medicare um, I don't think Medicare is an invasion of personal freedom. I think Medicare, like Social Security, are basic safety net for all Americans. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. 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 
They're my people, Irwin. <laughs> But I agree with her. Yeah, one. but uh, but up until now, you've at least been polite towards me. <laughs> um, I'd be thrilled to have a debate with anybody about Medicare and Social Security and whether or not they're desirable. Um, but so I think, in that sense, I, I don't think that Congress is going to ever eliminate Medicare. It would be political suicide for Congress to do that. Just like Congress is never going to eliminate Social Security. Um, in terms of Obama, uh, I'm not going to persuade anybody in this room. Um, I think Obama has overall done an excellent job as president. He inherited. <laughs> if you're going to no 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 no. If you'll let me talk, I'm glad to. But if you're going to shout me down, then there's no point in my being here. Now go ahead, or go ahead, finish. No, I mean, at the point at which you don't let me talk, that's just being rude, and there's no point in having the discussion. Um, I know that most of you in this room don't share my political views, so my saying to you that I think Obama did an excellent job isn't going to persuade you. But Obama inherited the worst economic situation since the Great Depression. And though the economic recovery has been slow, it has been pronounced. Unemployment has steadily gone down without a significant increase in inflation. Mortgage rates remain low. Housing starts are slowly picking up. And I think that this isn't the time to change president. I believe he's far more qualified than President Romney. So that's how if I had to take your position, how I would defend it. <laughs>